Hey, hey, welcome to the Citizen Mike Show. Thanks for tuning in. We do appreciate it. Craig Fishbein is going to join me uh, for another segment in just a few minutes. But until then, I want to bring you up to date on some of the developments that occurred at the town council meeting on October 12th. Uh, the YMCA made a presentation to the town, and most of you who watch the show know what that's all about. The Y is going to be building a new uh, swimming facility on the west side at the site of their of their current uh, their current building, their present building, and that new swimming facility looks like is going to be state of the art, uh, open all year round, retractable roof, a lot of amenities but it's expensive and the YMCA is looking to the town to contribute to the cost of that. Uh, the Y made a presentation to the councilors on Tuesday night and sort of explaining what they're doing, why they're doing it. And it was a sort of like the opening, um, the, the opening move in a negotiation, um, asking the town, do you want to join us in this, in this project? Now uh, the question, important question really is, what would the town have to contribute and what do people get back for that contribution? Because people could always join the Y if they want to, if they could afford to, they could join the Y and have access to that pool. The town doesn't have to contribute. The uh, fees that the Y currently charge for membership based upon the website that I looked at today, uh, uh, these are monthly rates uh, for an adult is $52 a month, a couple is $76 dollars a month and a family $84 a month. And presumably uh, if this or when this facility is opened in 2023, white members could have the option of swimming on the west side, swimming on the east side uh, all year round. So the question is to the counselors, uh, hey guys, uh, men and women, do you want to contribute to the cost of building the pool? The issue obviously is what do residents get back in exchange for this contribution? And that, you know, that is the major question, but it wasn't asked clearly and it wasn't answered clearly. And it, left, it was left um, a little bit in doubt. But for example, if this is built, if this Y facility is built, members of the town and members of the community, particularly on the west side, could easily join the Y if they could afford it, but they could join the Y and have access to the pool. So um, if they just wanted to use that pool for swimming all year round, knowing what the Y membership cost is, what would it mean to a family, let's say a family of four, to, to, to use that pool all year round once it's built? Would they get a break off the Y membership cost? Could they say pay $100 and have swimming all year round uh, for a family of four, what is, approximately what would that cost be? Um, if the answer is, well, um, we don't know, or we'll have to discuss that, it becomes like a little bit more um, squishy and a little less attractive because residents need to know what value is in it for them if their town pays a, a lump sum to the Y to help this pool get built. Um, the cost of the town's contribution, um, it, it, well, there's some confusion about that in my view. The, the figure of $2 million is out there and um, the Save Our Pool crowd is happy to say the cost of the town is $2 million, but that is not true. <laughs> that was the first number that was put out in a negotiation. Uh, and I, I think anyone who knows about negotiations or, follow, or is following the story carefully understands that is not going to be or would not be the final figure to the town. It would be a negotiated price. So if, for example, um, the cost of the town was $750,000 and a pool pass for a family of four might be, let's say, $200 all year round, um, would that be something that might be attractive? Well, this a lot of opponents to, to this would say, no, it's not going to be attractive. I don't care how cheap it is uh, I, for a family of four monthly. I don't care how cheap the price is to buy into this. Uh, there are many people that are just not interested in talking about this concept because they feel it would diminish the chances of a rebuild of community pools. So the first step is to reject this Y proposal, stop it in its tracks, 
and they feel that'll get the town closer to a rebuild of community pool. Well, that was the issue on Tuesday night, whether it was stated that way, uh, not exactly, but that was really the issue. Uh, the council seemed very cool to the idea. The mayor seemed cool to the idea. Um, the mayor said, well, it's going to be up to the park and rec department to see if there's a need for all year round swimming and and the, and the why should go uh, to the uh, to the rec department. That, in my view, sort of a deflection and abdication of of, uh, of responsibility, a very bureaucratic answer. But I think the bottom line is this: the wise the wise pool proposal to me looks like it's dead in the water. Not to say that why shouldn't try or uh, negotiations pick up at a later time. But for now, um, that seems to be over. That proposal seems to be over. And those that see the wise idea as a threat to the community pool, they can take comfort that this chapter seems to have been now closed. Another issue I will, I'll be talking with uh, Craig uh, about, and want to talk to you about it too, is this $13 million that the town is going to be getting, actually, it's got half of it already, I do believe, $13 million, um, thanks to the federal government and its American Rescue Plan. Uh, it's called ARPA. I'll be using the word ARPA from now on, American Rescue Plan Act. It was passed by Congress to help uh, uh, municipalities, uh, government entities uh, respond to the COVID pandemic and to um, address its effects, cover economic losses, um, things like that. The town is presently undecided as to how the money is going to be used, who's going to make the decision. It's, um, but the, the check, let's call it that, for $13 million does not come with no strings attached. There are certain limitations on how the money can be used. It's very important for the town of Wallingford uh, because it's a ton of money and um, uh, the, the, the money could be squandered, or the money could be of great benefit and use to, to everyone in town. Um, I want to uh, share with you some uh, news articles that have appeared in the paper dealing with how other towns have used this, this ARPA money. Uh, Essex, for example, is receiving 1.97 million in ARPA funds. And according to um, an article from a couple months ago, it has earmarked position, portions of the funding for public safety costs, including $75,000 to buy a new police car and 25,000 to replace the antennas on Essex Town Hall building. Um, the chief executive of the town of uh, Essex said that the town was also considering using a portion of the ARPA money to buy new air packs for the fire department. Essex is also using 35,000 of the ARPA money to pay for counseling uh, in the fire department. Uh, just another random article about East Lyme, what they're doing with it. It's among the projects uh, included in the funding package for East Lyme is money for Wi-Fi improvements at town hall, uh, $10,000 for the town's contribution towards the purchase of a refrigerated truck for a nonprofit, uh, some money to purchase uh, equipment to facilitate hybrid public meetings, $44,000 for security cameras, $75,000 to fund two positions at East Lime Youth Services, and uh, $132,000 to replace three dishes that transmit the signal used by the town's emergency public safety management system. That's East Lime. Let's go to Brookfield. Well, um, Chief Executive said that they're having meetings and they're getting a lot of ideas from members of the public. He said some of them are really good. Uh, groups have already raised ideas, he said including the possibility of bringing broadband to the Brookfield Housing Authority and contributing funds to a new sewer system by the Brookfield Craft Center. Uh, let's move on to East Hartford. Um, they're, getting, um, they're getting a lot of money. Uh, the town council has already approved um, over 10 million for some, you know, to use some of it. Two largest allocations are 4.5 million for storm water management repair and 3.5 million for renovation and handicap accessibility at the, at the library. Um, the chief executive of that town says um, that the library money uh, will provide a long-term benefit to the town of East Hartford through capital improvements and funding human infrastructure, such as uh, job literacy training and small business assistance. Um, 
it's not as those articles may create the impression that can, you can do whatever you want, whenever you want. It's not quite that simple. I just want to spend another minute to get into the complexity uh, before Craig comes on it. But eligible uses um, are as follows to respond to a public health emergency or its negative economic impact, including assistance to households, small businesses and nonprofits or to aid impacted industries such as tourism, travel and hospitality. But there's other uses. Um, it's to, the money can be used to respond to workers performing essential work during COVID-19. It could be used for government services to the extent that the town has um, sustained um, economic loss uh, or revenue uh, loss. And to make necessary investments in water, sewer, or broadband infrastructure, those are some of the general categories. The, the next to the last category is a little tricky because eligible uses include government services to the extent of the reduction in revenue due to COVID-19. What does that mean? Well, an example might be, let's say the town clerk is not recording as many documents. Every time you record a document, a fee is paid to the town of Wallingford. To the extent those fees went down, that would be a revenue loss. Let's say the ambulance service, maybe they go on fewer runs, but you know, to, but those, if any of those runs are covered by insurance, the ambulance would bill the insurance company and they would get the revenue from that. But if there are fewer ambulance runs because of COVID, there would be a revenue loss. Maybe the building department is not uh, issuing as many building permits and building revenue, building permit revenue goes down. That would be a revenue loss. You add up all these revenue losses and you put them in a category uh, for spending and that category is much, much broader than you might think. We'll get into that in just a minute. The mayor doesn't like to talk about that. And in fact, no town councilor has even asked about what the revenue loss is. If asked at a council meeting, the mayor would probably say, gee, I don't know. Of course he knows. Of course the comptroller knows. That'd be the first thing you'd look at. How much revenue loss have we sustained? And they'd be, they'd be making those calculations right away. Um, but here in Wallingford, we don't know what that revenue loss is. No one has asked. And probably to get that number, uh, you could have to pull some teeth or the mayor could say, well, we're hiring a consultant and we'll tell you then, you know, when we're ready to tell you. Uh, I want to get into what the uh, Government Finance Officers Association says about ARPA. Uh, the Government Finance Officers Association, I consider to be an authoritative source uh, for, um, for guidance, not that there aren't other authoritative sources, but I wanted to go over this with you to give you a flavor of uh, what others might be thinking about possible uses of the money. It's a, uh, in a question and answer format. Um, question, what are considered eligible expenditures in regard to containing or mitigating the spread of COVID-19? And um, the answer in part says, well, support for prevention, mitigation, or other services in congregate living facilities and schools enhancement of public health data systems, ventilation improvements in key settings like healthcare facilities. And I, I'm just giving you little bits and pieces. There's a, there's a lot more that uh, I can't read in the interest of time. Question, what community programs can the funding be used for? Answer, assistance to households or populations facing negative economic impacts due to COVID-19 is also an eligible use. This includes food assistance, rent, mortgage or utility assistance, counseling and legal aid to prevent eviction or homelessness, cash assistance, emergency assistance for burials, home repairs, weatherization or other needs, internet access or digital literacy assistance, or job training to address negative economic or public health impacts experienced through a worker's occupation or level of training. Ah, let's skip ahead can use the funds for the purchase of sanitation equipment, garbage trucks, and or public safety equipment like police and fire vehicles. Sanitation equipment is an eligible use, they, they answer. Public safety equipment is an eligible use. Now, this could all depend upon your revenue loss, as I have explained earlier. Wallingford may have 
500,000 of revenue losses or $5 million of revenue losses. We need to get a handle on that. Uh, well, let's get a final example. Um, what types of infrastructure can be covered is just one question of maybe 50. Well, for replacement of lost revenues, government services can include, but are not limited to a pay-go or pay-as-you-go funded building of infrastructure, including roads, modernization of cybersecurity, including hardware, software, and protection of critical infrastructure, health services, environmental remediation, school or educational services, and the provision of police, fire, and other public safety services. Remember, that's, the, that's only to the extent of government revenue loss. Uh, the question is really, or in part, how do we decide where the money goes? What criteria should be applied? Who are the people at the table to make those decisions? And what's the best way of going about it? For that, we're going to talk with Craig Fishbein. Stand by. Hey, Craig, thanks for joining the show and, and popping in. We've been talking about the uh, ARPA money, you know, $13 million of federal dollars that the town of Wallingford needs to spend. Um, it's been reported a couple of times in the paper. Mary's talked about it a couple of times, but are you comfortable with um, the decision-making process so far? And if not, why not? And if so, why? Well, I have to tell you as a, as a seasoned member of the town council, you know, if I, think, I think if I was a freshman, I, I, would, be, uh, I would be satisfied. But I've learned through, you know, trust but verify. Um, I'm not that comfortable with the trajectory. I um, I share Councillor Testa's concerns um, that we are an afterthought, and um, I want to be active and at the table. I want to know really what's going on. We're dealing with a lot of money. Um, you know, I don't want to see a list of this is where it's going. Please approve at the back end. I want to see a menu. This is what we could use it for and, you know, think outside the box. Um, yeah. You know, so so uh, I want to play Vinny Testa's uh, video that we've, we've clipped. It's a collage of comments that he made at a recent council meeting. But to set the table for that, um, the, the mayor has said on uh, occasions that he wants to use the $13 million available to Wallingford to give relief to businesses or small businesses. At different times, he'll sort of expand that and say, oh, nonprofits and other things. But he has said that, and that's appeared in the paper um, that way. And I think um, the council's expectation, yours, and I think the way you expressed that at Benny Testa's, was that you have a role. Listen to what Benny Testa has to say, and then we'll unpack that. The current theme of my questioning has always been, um, that we get assurances that the town council would be involved in a, in a meaningful and active way. And on at least two occasions, I was assured by you directly that this would be the case. Uh, I think it's reasonable to then expect that um, a consultant would be hired and then we would be, uh, we thereafter would have meetings to develop together a game plan. In the meantime, I've heard of meetings with business people involving our economic development specialists, discussions with the Economic Development Commission. Um, and I have to say what was the most surprising development, a pretty detailed op-ed piece from Mr. Stephen Knight, which seemed to indicate that he was told quite a bit about what the plans already were. Um, I read in the paper how things were being done already. Meetings were had have already been held. I read about all this in an op-ed from Steve Knight not even in a story in the paper, but from him. And one thing stood out, no mention whatsoever of the town council. I would anticipate certainly economic development playing a big role. But whatever people have written about, uh, certainly I've had no discussion with Mr. Knight. But a lot of towns don't seem to even be uh, dealing with the, the application process for private business as individuals. Um, any of them are just looking at it as a way of funding municipal projects. I, I don't take that view. I think the most important thing is being able to provide some redress for people and businesses who have lost as a result of the COVID and the pandemic. So that's going to take some work to put together. And I don't believe that 
we should only be involved when it comes time to approve the appropriations. Because that's where it's headed. It's headed where we're not going to be involved. But when decisions are made on where, mo what money goes where, maybe we'll be given the opportunity to say yes. The reason we need to have this all out in the open is because you don't want people in the public thinking, well, that particular place or that particular restaurant got $50,000 because, you know, they're friends with this one. And I don't expect that. I'm not expecting that to happen but by the administration. I, but we don't want that appearance. But we should be talking about uh, how do we want to divvy this money up? All I will say is this. Steve Knight doesn't write anything without having talked to a lot of people. And if Steve Knight writes something like that, he didn't just make it up. And there were things in there that made me um, rip the paper a lot harder than I normally do when I was reading it. Let's just say that. So that, well, thank you. I don't know who he talked with. I know he didn't talk with me, so I don't know. I didn't see the article. I didn't read it. But I want to stress, I'd be very disappointed if that involvement ends up being one of approving things when they're brought to us. That was just kind of described again. I'd like us to be involved in the early stages, like now. I mean, I, I, don't, I would not dismiss doing a big project, personally, because what I worry about is uh, handing out money, even through an application process, years after. I mean, we're going to hand people. I, I understand how much businesses have suffered. But, but the people getting them, I mean, who's getting the money in 2023 or 2024? They're the ones that have survived. You know, it's, so that's my fear versus, you know, lower the sewer rates. Or, you know, I think one North Haven's talking about building a splash pad or something. But again, I don't know how you give it to businesses without having some sort of, uh, without making it appear to be some kind of cronyism, right? Because uh, again, like Councilor Chartel said, it's, it's only the survivors. So I'm actually okay with hearing what the consultant says. And then if we don't like it, you reject it. Craig, uh, the piece written by Steve Knight that uh, Vinny Testa referred to said in part, ultimately the decision on each grant, each grant meaning the piece of the $13 million pie. He wrote, ultimately the decision on each grant will be made by the mayor, but always in consultation with other departments such as economic development, public utilities, and in the case of nonprofits, youth and social services. I think that's what got Vinny Testa kind of steamed off. Um, Me too. What role should the EDC have? What role should the council have? And what role should the consultant have in the decision-making process on what to do with the $13 million? So I think that the consultant's role is the gatekeeper to advise the town as to what it could do. That's my understanding as to the role, reason why we're going to get that individual. The EDC, they have a limited mission of, you know, um, economic development in the town, which doesn't extend to all phases of the town. Um, so they would have a role perhaps to make recommendations uh, within the confines of what the, uh, the, the individual uh, says they could do. Um, ultimately, I think the, the council is the umbrella together with the mayor. It's the legislative branch and the executive branch. If we did this um, like up in Hartford, essentially the executive branch at times would come to the legislative branch and make requests. But basically, it's the legislative branch um, making those determinations in concert with the executive branch. So, you know, as Vinny Testa says, you know, I think we should be there from the beginning and, um, you know, working hand in hand. I, you know, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to see last night's council meeting. There's a lengthy discussion about Tyler Mill and trails there, you know, and trails got used a lot during the pandemic. And, you know, is that something that would be contemplated is, you know, blazing a couple trails for the mountain bikers or something like that, you know, under the, the confines of what the mayor has at least said and Steve Knight has reported, I don't think that would fall within it, but I'd like to have that discussion. 
here's what concerns me. And um, I, I like to, I'd like to try to look around the corner, you know, not just one step at a time, put blinders on, we'll tell you how to, how to walk, but I like to look around the corner and play the chess game out three or four, you know, moves in advance to see where we may end up on the current trajectory. Here's what worries me, that the mayor picks the consultant. In the course of that selection process, which is an interview process, the mayor inculcates the consultant with the notion that the only safe way to spend this money is to give it to businesses. So that when the consultant appears before you, I don't know at what stage, you know, the consultant does appear before you. The consultant has already has a predisposition to give it, give the money to businesses. And if someone says, well, how about Tyler Mill? I mean, you know, if that was used or could be used in the future in the event of another pandemic, people want to get outside more and that needs refurbishing. The consultant might say, no, 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 that's too risky and steer you, steer you away. Or if someone, you know, just has another idea, you know, drawn from other towns or um, uh, other reliable sources is for another use. The consultant steps in for the mayor and says, oh, no, it's got to be for businesses. If does that worry you? And if it does in any way, can you stop that sort of decision-making process and insert your own? Well, it certainly worries me. Um, you know, we do see from time to time aspects of that sort of thing. But, you know, I've been up there a while. and You've seen me do certain things. You know, the year that the state gave us $2.4 million more um, in town revenue after we had done our budget. Remember, I came to the town and said, we can modify our budget. And the mayor and the law department said, no, you can't, you know, it's against the charter. And ultimately we got it done, right? Um, so, you know, there's some really smart people up on the council, you know, presently that do a lot of research. Um, you know, I've got to think that we're going to be reviewing those documents just as long as the, you know, alongside the consultant at some level, and we'll challenge that. Um, you know, so ultimately, if there is a, a difference in determination, it's, you know, our job to um, debate a particular item, you know, Tyler Mill, you know, this is why, this is the language, this is what it falls in between, this is why we should do it, and convince the other counselors to do it. Now, that begs the question that I've thought about a lot. Um, it would still call for the executive branch to do so. So what if the council just upsets the apple cart and says, no, Mayor, everything that you've proposed, we don't agree with, we're gonna do our own thing. These are the things we're gonna do. It's approved. What happens to the money? Well, that's the ultimate threat that the mayor has over you if the council doesn't take some initiative and insert itself you know, early in the game. I think what Benny Testa was, was saying, what he's afraid of the, is that the council as a body sits back, consultant is hired, which according to the mayor is, starts everything. Doesn't have to be that way, but that's the mayor wants it. The, the consultant proposes things piecemeal, an application process, and you approve it piecemeal. And then the consultant goes back and a couple of months later, the consultant comes up with a list these are the people that are going to get the money. Thurston Foods, two million. Old Brick Steel, million and a half. Michael's Restaurant, 50 grand. All the restaurants uptown where you Republicans go drinking, 25 grand. I'm serious about this. You know, all those, all those businesses that are now on the list, and he says, you know, take it or leave it. That's what I think Benny Test is worried about. You can say yes or no. You say no. Tell me. Yeah, I mean, we say no. What happens? Do we have to give the money back? I, I, I don't know. That's a question for the, the person, the independent person is supposed to be coming in. But yeah, I, I, I share that concern. Um, you said independent person coming in. And the point I was trying to make a couple minutes ago, I questioned the independence right off the bat. Uh, I, I'm I, just identifying the individual. Yeah, yeah, he is the consultant. I want to ask you a philosophical question. Um, the issue of uh, public projects versus money for private interests. Public projects could be um, 
you know, water, uh, sewer, uh, broadband, or other public projects if they qualify, or private businesses, and I think it was Joe Marone, and you know, they said in that clip, you know, you're worried about the appearance of cronyism. Tell me where you stand on giving money to, let's say, Thurston Food, 1.5 million. Yolbrook Steel, you know, 2 million. Doesn't that, I guess, I doesn't that kind of to... worry you a little bit? Oh, no, it totally worries me. I, yeah. You know, it totally, I'd have to see the basis for the appropriation. That's, I would hope that there's some sort of backup. You know, there's going to be criteria. There's going to be a, a backup. Um, but I can, you know, I can, that's why I, I said there's some really smart people up there. You know, what Joe had to say was right on point. I'll give you the backup. And I'm not going to use names of companies anymore. I'll make up a, a company. Uh, Jones Corporation made it up. Doesn't exist. Jones Corporation is a Wallingford Corporation owned by a couple of rich guys. Net worth 20 to $30 million. They own this corporation and they can very easily show, let's say, that because of the pandemic, their corporations lost $5 million. And I want to say, assume, arguendo, they can demonstrate a, a loss of profits of $5 million. I can also assume, arguendo, they're really rich guys. They were rich before the pandemic, rich during the pandemic, and rich after the pandemic. Should those kind of public interests get Five thousand dollars to cover their loss, and the public sector not get that five thousand. Where do you stand on that? Five thousand or five million? Five million. I'm sorry. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. Um, given the limited confines of what you gave me, I would be adverse to that uh, because then you're leaving, um, you know, a balance of what eight million dollars uh, for the rest. Um, you know, I would want to see the criteria. Um, and all of the applications, but certainly, uh, let, let's say every business in town was automatically deemed to be able to get funds, every business uh, established prior to the pandemic. That's the criteria, you know, based upon it's uh, 5% of their uh, net revenue for the year, uh, something, something like that. Yeah. Um, that probably would not reach the five million in your scenario. Well, I was that, just taking a chunk that, that, of the third. I was yeah, taking. I wouldn't give a chunk. I would not give a chunk like that. Certainly not to one business. I, I just I wouldn't do that. Um, to answer your question. Yeah, but I want to go back to um, would it be better avoid the appearance of favoritism, keep the public money in the public sector by using all the money for nonprofits and public sector projects that qualify. Or the, may or the mayor's position, it should go to private interest, to private business. Where do you stand on that philosophical divide? I, I think I'm, um, I'm a 60, 40 more towards, um, if you had to choose between the two, um, the public interest. Well, the way I see the mayor lining this up, and he's not a guy to collaborate or share power, been watching him for over 20 years, it's not how he operates. The way he's lining it up, there's gonna be a list of businesses, maybe some nonprofits sprinkled in, a list of businesses that claim they can verify their losses, it'll all add up to 13 million. Um, there might be a small public project or something like that, but basically, almost all of it goes to private business. I think you're saying, if that's how it ended up, you're not comfortable with that. Given the limited criteria that you have given me, I would not be comfortable with that, yeah. Yeah, what am I missing from my question? Is there something well, I Well, there's a lot of, I mean, it depends on, you know, how it's parsed out, how it's determined, how, I mean, as I said, if every business in town got some money, um, and there is no cronyism, right? I, I, you know, because there's businesses in town that support Democrats too, right? Um, I feel a little bit more comfortable there, but when it's, you know, 20 larger businesses 
that uh, I, I, I'd be uncomfortable there. So that's all I can say given the criteria. Yeah, the other thing that concerns me, and I want to round table that we're, you know, we're, we're just shooting the breeze here, you know, what if, what if, but forewarned is forearmed. During this application process, Jones Corporation, remember my fictitious corporation, puts in an application. Uh, they verify uh, to the consultant a loss of five million. Then someone says, you know, in the interest of transparency, mayor and consultant, I want to see the backup. And I also want to see the net worth of these guys. And the answer comes back that's proprietary. You can't see that. That's what the state of Connecticut has done in, with past grants. You can't see any of the backup. You can't see their net worth. Nope. Jones Corporation run by Sam Jones and Mary Jones, according to the consultant, has suffered a loss of five million. They qualify, they're eligible. We're gonna give them five million and don't ask questions about how rich they are. Mind your place, you're just a council. We have a consultant and a mayor. <laughs> you, you're, you, you're, you're just there to say yes or no. It, the transparency issue that I've outlined, how do you get around that? You know, I don't begrudge people um, how much money they make. I. I you know, I'm not one to go after that. Um, so that's not an area that I, you know, if somebody shows losses, a loss is a loss. But if they, you know, already had $20 million in the bank and they lost money during the pandemic, they still lost money during the pandemic. So their, their net worth in the confines of what we're discussing, to me at least, is, is irrelevant. Okay. Um get that i just want to make the contrast between our views clear i strenuously object to giving town money to rich guys because they suffered a loss really really bothers me that it comes out of the public sector where everyone can benefit and a rich guy ends up with the money i'm really bothered by that now we talk well, about rich guys also employ many people so yeah, that's fine. That's fine. And they make money off of those people. I don't want to get into this. They're job creators. They can get away with anything they want. I, I don't want to get into that. I want to get into some mills, the definition of a small business, because the mayor said we're going to give it to small business. You're a small business, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. You probably suffered losses of the pandemic. Not as many trials, settlements, closings. Will I got to tell you, I was busier during the pandemic than I was before. So <laughs> All right, so we'll strike you from the list. I could do three courts in a day. You didn't have to drive to court. Well, I don't want to see your name on that on that list then. Vinny Cervoni. Vinny Cervoni is a small business. Uh, he is. Um, I bet, I'll bet you on that Economic Development Commission, there's probably two or three at least people that have an interest in the small in small businesses in Wellington. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, this is the problem I'm trying to I'm trying to flesh out. We think of a small business as a maybe a, a, a poor struggling storefront, you know, that that barely made it, and they get money three years after their loss, which is what Shortel, uh, Christopher Shortel, was saying. They've survived. Uh, small businesses are orthopedic surgeons and eye doctors and architects and you know professional people, and and they may have better access to the application process. And the and the the uh, servers at restaurants um, have already, you know, they're they're probably not going to have as much access to this pot of money. Now the mayor say, oh no, households, you know. Well, I don't know, you know, we'll see. But the mayor never stressed common folks that work for a living that had their hours cut back. He always stressed business, business, business. And I say, well, you know, that not only is that cronyism to give you know money to rich guys, and you're sacrificing. I don't what want do to. What do you do? Yeah, what do you my, do fa yeah. my favorite restaurant in the downtown area closed yeah. during the pandemic. Well, they should get as much as you want to give them. I, well, I don't necessarily know that that is the intent, unless the money is going to be used in some way to employ people, but. You know, because of that restaurant being unable to do outdoor dining, they had to close. Um, yeah. 
You know, I think that's a whole criteria in and of itself. If you can document that you had to close as a result of the pandemic, sure. yeah. you know, you got a loss. So I want to change the subject um, and get to some of the mechanics of, of building out this money. Talk about, I want to talk about eligible uses for a minute. Um, before you came on the show, we reviewed some of those uh, eligible uses, but to the extent that the town had a revenue loss because of the pandemic, whether it's 1 million or 5 million, the eligible uses open way up if the town can demonstrate a revenue loss. For example, you know, the town clerk not recording as many documents, building department not getting as many much fees in for building permits, so on and so forth. The eligible uses open way up, yet the mayor has not discussed the economic loss to the town because of the pandemic. And I think that's the place to start. Tim Cena, the new comptroller, next meeting or the meeting after that because consultants are being hired. What are, is our economic loss and give us the tabulation so we know how much money can be put to much broader uses, roads. You know, you can use road money, fire trucks with money that represents an economic loss. Um, How's that sit with you? What I just suggested. Are we? Are you? Are you not? Uh, you're being too uppity by asking for that kind of for that kind of information. No, um, you know, a lot of times when we ask about numbers this time of year, the response is, "Well, we don't know where the numbers are until we get the audit." But do you know, believe that? I, mean, no, I don't. Um, All right. Any? I mean, no. Um, <laughs> So when we go on, yeah, um, I, you know, I'm certainly open to that conversation and uh, would like to have that information and to take advantage of that for the things that you mentioned. Okay, um, let's change the subject completely. Um, there's a little bit of a dust up at the council meeting on October 12. It had to do with the um, the paving of the Wallace Avenue parking lot, or really the fact that it wasn't going to get paved this year, I think there's an expectation that maybe it would have or should have, um, as compared to the Simpson Court parking lot, which is all done. Um, and the mayor's position was, don't worry about it, it's going to get paved. Uh, it's just a matter of we're not going to be able to do it this year, we're going to do it uh, in the spring. And it caused kind of a dust up. Would you walk through why this was a dust up and why this is a, an issue? Well, you know, the Wallace Avenue lot is our land. It's owned by the town. Simpson Court, storied story, right? Over a decade now. Um, you know, I didn't like it that in the middle of a pandemic, the, the mayor and the council put through a, this very controversial vote um, made it virtually impossible to have the people speak on which they had the opportunity to previously. And the mayor, um, you know, at the meeting was pretty, pretty damn adamant that, you know, if we didn't approve Simpson Court, then Wallace Avenue wasn't getting done. I think he said it four or five times. Yeah. So that was the, you know, that was the bait because we want Wallace Avenue to be done. You know, I, years ago, I was the one who said, we got to be able to use that thing for celebrate Wallingford. And we brought Henry McCulley in. Where are you? Let's get it paved and all that stuff. And, you know, um, so that was really important to us. Uh, well, to me, at least. And, you know, what I, I want it to be a nice inviting lot also. So I had suggested don't do these regular lights. Let's do period lights. Let's say, make something inviting. And I was told, we were all told, oh, no, no, no. There's not enough time to do that. We'd have to go back to planning and zoning. We'd have to get reapproved. So we can't have period light. Okay, fine. Because you're going to do the lot. So now they put out Simpson Court to bid last April. Um, yeah, it was right around that time. Um, that project got done. The mayor told us that it was completed. They didn't put 
uh, Wallace Avenue out to bid. Um, it was believed that Public Works was going to do that, but evidently when the numbers came in so good on Simpson Court, uh, they said, well, let's put Wallace Avenue out to bid. Well, the numbers to the mayor's opinion came in too high. And, you know, that's a whole thing in and of itself, because based upon his correspondence, it was $100,000 too high for that lot. But they saved $114,000 on the Simpson Court lot. So they have the money to do the project. But the mayor is saying, we're going to um, put it out to bid next year. So it didn't make a lot of sense. And also, you know, I have the bid documents. The, um, the bidder on the Simpson Court project gave a warranty of one year. Their bid on the Wallace Avenue law gave a warranty of two years. So the number itself was automatically artificially inflated. They did that voluntarily. All the other bidders bid one year warranty. So going back to the bidder and saying, hey, will you give us the same warranty you gave it on Simpson? It would have brought that number down even lower. So the dust up was, you know, we get a letter all of a sudden last week saying, it's going to go out to bid next next year. Let me give you my thoughts and then we'll sign off. Uh, it's a little bit of a different take. The, the mayor's letter um, explaining why Wallace wasn't going to be happening this fall seemed to say there wasn't enough money in the accounts. Huh? And I wasn't sure what account he was talking about. Uh, and so he says we're going to send it out to bid in the spring. Well, there's still not going to be enough money in the account. Because the account, I think, that he's talking about only has $77,000 in it. I think that's the account he's talking about. It'll never have enough money. So I said, what are you, are you trying to treat us like common fools, Mayor? What, what, why did you say that? Well, see, that's, yeah. that, that was a misconception because there's actually, I believe it's 124 because it, there was already, I think it was 49000 in the account when we approved it. So I had made a motion at that meeting on January 12th to appropriate 124 then was told that we only needed to do 77 to do the plan so there's a there's about 124 in the account plus if well, we just take the Simpson over yeah I was just looking at the financial reports and I see what I see what the accounts are from the financial reports and I'm trying to match the mayor's letter with the documentation uh, one account for Wallace Avenue, seventy-seven thousand. There's one hundred and fourteen thousand left over from Simpson Court. There's forty thousand left over from two thousand and ten for Wallace Ave, and another seven or eight thousand left over in two thousand eleven or twelve for Wallace Ave. There's tons of money there already appropriated on and on hand for Wallace Ave, and the mayor's making it appear like we don't have the money. There's not the money in the account. I'm just saying I'm reading his letter and I can't make it work. I just can't make it add up. So I. I'm just wondering, is America going to say the same thing next year? Look at that account, 77000 not enough money. The bid is obviously going to come in over that. It was 200000 right? The low bid, one ninety five or something? Uh, uh, yeah, I recall. That, yeah. That, right? Hey, let's, let's call it a night. Uh, we've run out of time. Thanks for coming on the Citizen Mike Show. Uh, we do appreciate it. And we'll see you next time around, Craig. Good luck in the election. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay.